And so what I have to say is really uh, not new. In fact, um, I'll be mentioning things that others have discussed in a lot more detail during earlier talks. But I hope that by offering what might be considered something of a consumer perspective, I can um, help synthesize and integrate what we've been hearing about today into the uh, larger picture of our knowledge of how genetics and environmental factors contributed to human health and disease. Now, this is a slide from the Department of Energy's uh, public slide gallery, which was made available early on in the Human Genome Project. And the title says, Gene Chips Reveal Susceptibilities. If only it were that easy. Because what they really reveal is data. And through, by dint of, of effort and cleverness and, and high technology, we can transform that, those data into information. This is the very same image that Terry showed earlier um, of results of a genome-wide association study in type 2 diabetes. But we don't really want information either. What we really want is knowledge, and this is what's being touted as the, the key to personalized medicine. So where's the knowledge? That's what we really want. Right now, what we mostly have is a lot of data. We have more data than any other thing. <laughs> we have more data than information and certainly more than we have knowledge. So in, in trying to offer some, some comments on synthesizing and integrating the results of genome-wide association studies, I'm going to first uh, review a, a little bit of the uh, experience in replicating genetic associations in general. Um, and in doing so, I'll, I'll make a contrast uh, in the aims of such studies between identifying novel associations and measuring their effects in populations, um, and mention a few methodologic issues that pertain to genome-wide associations. Then I'll describe some network approaches, many of which have already been discussed in great detail and by other speakers. Um, I'll focus uh, on the Human Genome Epidemiology Network, which is a network of epidemiologists, actually, and um, is the one that I work on. And I'll give a few other examples. And finally, I'm going to discuss two important results that are well known uh, as success stories in genetic association studies to try to show how the results of candidate gene and genome-wide association studies can fit together. So thanks to that wonderful scientific resource, PubMed, we can actually monitor um, the growth of science in this area. And these data are from um, uh, a database that we ha have produced from PubMed on an ongoing basis since 2001 by uh, conducting a sweep weekly of the new scientific publications added to the PubMed database and identifying the ones that are so genetic association studies of uh, mostly of unrelated persons. And you can see that the number of published gene disease association studies has grown tremendously just over the last five or six years um, to, the, to the point that we now have over 5,000 such uh, publications entered into to PubMed annually. Uh, studies of genetic association that actually examine some other factor from the environment have grown at a much slower pace. Those are in green, the, the green subset. And then there's also a small but growing number of meta-analyses to synthesize the results of these candidate uh, gene association studies. Now, as early as 2001, it was clear that there were problems in replicating the results of uh, genetic association studies of candidate genes. And this is a rather famous graphic from a paper by John Ioannidis that was published in Nature Genetics in 2001 showing that often the, the first um, publication of, of a particular uh, gene disease association had the most extreme um, outcome or odds ratio, and that over time as the study, the same association was studied by other investigators, the uh, the effect tended to converge either to a very small or to a null result. And John Ioannidis called this the Proteus phenomenon. 
after the uh, Greek god who could metamorph himself, metamorphose himself into many different um, shapes. And, and so basically, you know, there's been a lot of uh, jousting with results of these scattered uh, non-replicating genetic association studies. And in this article, John, uh, who has written extensively on the topic, recommended a systematic uh, approach using meta-analysis. Now, around the same time, um, we uh, established what is known as the Human Genome Epidemiology, or HUGE Net Collaboration, which now has four coordinating centers. Um, in addition to the one at CDC, there's a HUGE Net Canada um, headquarters is at the University of Ottawa, also in Cambridge, the UK, and uh, the University of Ioannina, for obvious reasons. And the main f functions of this particular network are the published literature scan and review that I mentioned, the uh, production of systematic reviews, um, methodologic work to strengthen reporting of associations, and also to promotion of network collaboration. And just uh, a schematic to show um, how we have pursued this, I have here something that's a figure that was published in uh, January 2006 in a, in a commentary that described our, uh, our approach. And um, the, the first uh, workshop that we had to discuss this model was to focus on a network of networks, which I'll describe in a, in a minute. That was in November of 2005. Uh, since then, we've had others that, folk, first of all, devised um, um, standardized procedures for reviewing and conducting meta-analysis of such associations. There's an online handbook that was published in 2006, and an addendum is being developed currently for uh, genome-wide associations, a result of genome-wide association studies. Um, a study, I mean, a workshop last summer in Canada focused on strengthening the reporting of genetic associations with uh, some, some guidance. Last fall, there was another uh, group that met to discuss, this says grading, but basically the evaluation of evidence for an association. And in Atlanta next year, we, we hope to um, gather people back together to, to discuss this model and, and the uh, body of evidence to date. Now, reasons why um, replication of genetic associations has been challenging can be divided roughly into three categories. First of all, there's heterogeneity that we've discussed quite a bit already today. And there are many different reasons why uh, heterogeneity may, may occur within the context of, of different studies, including um, different differences in, in phenotypic measures perhaps differences in, true differences in under, underlying um, genetic factors, but there are also many unmeasured factors, including exposures that might play an important role. The second major category has to do with statistical uncertainty and, and basically the, the usual uh, problems, including type one error, which can occur when just based on sampling variability when many, many comparisons are made, and also the problem of low power, which, you know, many of the um, early studies were quite small, and you know, even genome-wide association studies may be too small uh, to detect small effects, and this is another reason that's already been presented for um, pooling data and, and collaborating in analysis. And finally, there are biases that can um, affect the results, including all the usual epidemiologic biases, and perhaps um, particularly important in this field, publication bias, where, you know, another very likely explanation for this Proteus phenomenon is that positive results are, are especially initially, are much more likely to be published than those that are negative. So, 
How do these concerns differ when we're talking about genome-wide association studies? There's still, the same problems are still there. Um, there are perhaps a few advantages here and there, and additional kinds of information one can use to get at some of them. For example, as has already been um, discussed quite extensively here, um, we can address at least one of the unmeasured factors, which is the um, different genetic background, especially among different ethnic groups that could result in population stratification. Um, with respect to sampling variability, a number of statistical techniques are being explored for um, addressing this. And in terms of low power, there's the use of meta-analysis that David Hunter already showed several uh, large ones, and the use of prior information from candidate genes, which can be used to um, inform the analysis. Now, we still have all the usual epidemiologic biases, but to the extent that the um, data collection methods and protocols can be made available for other investigators to peruse, the greater transparency can at least provide insight into what those biases might be. So having that kind of information available, for example, on, in the dbGaP resource along with the study data really has great potential to um, address at least uh, provide some information to address the problem. Publication bias, of course, still remains a problem. Although by enhancing access to data, as has just been discussed through either dbGaP or other data sharing mechanisms, um, people will be able to perhaps um, interrogate the, these other sources for the same association and um, demonstrate variation in the results of that. So as I mentioned, um, our particular network has um, done some work in the area of systematic reviews and meta-analysis and has made this handbook for systematic reviews available online. I'm providing the CDC link, although it actually resides on the um, University of Ottawa website. We also maintain a database of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which has, we currently have sponsored about 50 such reviews that are published in collaboration with uh, about 10 journals that allow us to publish those um, reviews simultaneously online. And we also have a citation database of about 550 meta-analyses that have been conducted so far. Also in progress are some guidance for uh, reporting association, and pub association data and publications. And um, as I mentioned, criteria for evaluating the evidence. And more information about all of these things can be found on the HugeNet website. So is synthesizing information from genome-wide association studies any different from that in collected in candidate gene studies? Well, one, one, one thing to mention, I think, is that this, the priorities of such studies may differ. I mean, an important goal of the genome-wide association studies is to identify novel associations, whereas at, at least now a predominant goal of candidate gene studies is to measure the size of the effect. Now, in principle, you know, both, both approaches can be used for both things, but currently a lot of the excitement about the genome-wide association study results stems from the discovery of novel associations that remain to be um, tested. Most differences between these types of studies are really a matter of degree. We still have to consider type 1 error. We have to consider type 2 errors. We still have the issue of harmonization among studies, especially uh, of phenotypic information. Um, also among different genotyping platforms. This has already been discussed quite a bit. And there are methods to deal with all of these things. Likewise, population stratification is, is still an issue. So the more information is available about each of the studies, the more um, transparent they are, the better the 
the um, information obtained from synthesis. So what's the purpose of, of conducting meta-analysis of data from genome-wide association studies? We've seen some examples. Uh, this, this approach can improve the power to measure small effects, um, to assess heterogeneity among genome-wide association studies. There are methodological challenges also discussed earlier, uh, such as the use of different genotyping platforms, the harmonization of data, especially when different uh, criteria are used to define phenotype of interest, and also the treatment of replication samples that are um, within the same genome-wide association study, a phenomenon that is quite typical. Um, but I think, you know, to me anyway, that meta-analysis has its limits. I mean, it's definitely a good way to start, but it really is not the end all of, of data integration because it's really only good for um, synthesizing data in one dimension. So this is just a, a draft of um, some proposed evaluation criteria for considering individual gene disease associations. And um, so I guess a proposal rather than guidance. And, and basically there are five main categories that tend to span not only validity, but I guess to a certain extent utility of, of um, the discoveries. And they are effect size, the amount of evidence and replication, protection from bias, biological plausibility, and relevance to um, health conditions. And, and really only the first two can be addressed by meta-analysis, and the other things are somewhat subtle in, in many ways and, and can't be uh, assessed in any automatic way. So. I may have failed to point it out, but at the center of my big wagon wheel image was uh, the expression network of networks. Why network of networks? Why, what's the utility of this approach? Well, the way we think of this is as a, a way to bridge cottage industry with big science, to quote Bob Hoover, who talked about this at SER last year, um, and a way to, to prior to trying to combine everything in one final uh, repository like dbGaP, there's really a great deal that can be done by investigators working together within a particular domain. And we've already heard numerous examples of that. Because people who are working on the same problem tend to share not only specific knowledge, and for example, there are within fields groups that devise phenotypic criteria that can be used to standardize the collection of clinical data and, and phenotypic data and epidemiologic studies. So there's specific knowledge. There's awareness of current research problems so that the, um, the publication of the uh, results has a feedback, there it provides a feedback mechanism to the research agenda. And they tend to share funding sources. So you see, for example, in the National Cancer Institute, which has had a, a consortium model in place for many years, this, this um, network of networks idea is already in place. And in other places, uh, as um, Andy Singleton mentioned in his talk, you know, there are various kinds of, of consortia and um, collaborations that can come together for a single purpose in an ad hoc way or for a prolonged collaboration in a research area. And many, research, many networks already exist. Some of these were mentioned earlier. Uh, the first two are NIH-sponsored. There are also international collaborations that, that tend to overlap with some of the, um, the NIH-funded projects. Some are independent. Uh, there are big ones, like this one on uh, genetic susceptibility to environmental carcinogens, but then there are also very small ones, nascent ones, that have been formed to, to um, address smaller topics, such as um, the PREBIC collaborative to study preterm birth. Okay. Now, here's a crazy network image, but I do love it because it shows just what can be done when data are made available. This is actually based on OMIM, a network model that connects genes 
that have been studied in association with diseases and where associations have been found. And the top one is disease-centered, and the bottom one is gene-centered. And you can see these are not random. Of course, to a certain extent, it's a looking under the light post phenomenon. But there probably are true relations in there. And this is based entirely on data in OMEN and was done by physicists, by the way. <laughs> so here's another model of a network that, that I think is worth showing. It's uh, the ALTS gene database, which is embedded in the Alzheimer Research Forum, which is a, uh, a collaborative group to, to promote research on Alzheimer disease. And again, the data are con obtained by sweeping PubMed for public publications and are uh, curated in this database, which can also perform online meta-analyses. And Lars Bertram at Harvard is the uh, founder and curator of that. Here's the P3G Observatory. It's this, um, in, from Montreal, where they are also trying to create a repository of, of questionnaires and, uh, and comparison tools, and they have compiled a number of them um, from, from 11 studies in the U.S. and other countries. I think they should connect up with dbGaP. So in two minutes, I may not have time to tell my tale of two associations. You don't believe me. It's 3.40. I don't believe you, no. <laughs> but anyway, okay, I'll, I'll hit the buttons fast, and you will get an impressionistic image. Okay, so this association between CARD15 and Crohn's disease is a huge success of the candidate gene era. It was discovered in 2001. And as we've already heard, complement factor H and age-related macular degeneration is a huge success of the genome-wide association study era. Here's the natural history of big discovery. Uh, if you, the pink is card 15. Lots and lots of replications. It's an early success. Has offered key insights into pathogenesis and phenotype, but six years later, we're not entirely sure how to use this. Um, it hasn't replicated in all populations, and it was hoped at the time that it would uh, be useful in uh, identifying patients who could benefit from infliximab, which at the time was a big new uh, treatment intervention, but it didn't work. However, genome-wide association has been helpful and since I don't have time to discuss it, I would suggest that everyone who hasn't looked at this do so. Um, it is a commentary by Long Carden following the publication of the IL-23R association with Crohn's disease, which shows just how a genome-wide association in combination with candidate gene data can be used to uh, expand the knowledge horizon. This is the macular degeneration. You see CFH dropped on the scene in 2005 been replicated many, many times, and there already have been three meta-analyses. Another early success provided great insight into pathogenesis and progression. There was a recent study examining, examining interaction with smoking and BMI. Uh, directions for translation isn't clear. It doesn't currently have any utility for screening. And in fact, there was no interaction in that same uh, uh, environmental factor study with the uh, treatment assignment in the ARIDS trial, although I was very disappointed, even though the author said there was no interaction, I was very disappointed that the data weren't presented. Isn't that the thing you would most want to know? You, you need to finish up, Mark. Okay. So I won't repeat this. Instead, I'm going to use Terry's slide. And this, you know, she called it the wave. That's good. Waves can be good or bad. I've heard it called it tsunami. Let's not call it that. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. That's what we want, right? <laughs> <laughs>